Chapter 7 The Ruined Dwarf Hold Gatrek crouched before a granite block, hidden away within the corner of a ruined wall at the riverside end of a wide, empty street. Felix stood nervously at the slayer's back, fingers fidgeting around the grip of his sword. The buildings were constructed in what he had come to think of as the dwarfish fashion. Massive blocks laid atop each other with such expertise and precision that there was no sign of mortar, and by Munsleep's haunting light it was next to impossible for a human eye to discern the joints. There was an eerie stillness about this place, a graveyard serenity that the faraway murmur of the river could not detract from. It was impossible to stand here, surrounded by such age, and not wonder at the forgotten lives that had touched it. Who had they been? What had they done? Did anything of them survive in the world he knew? The romantic in him, perhaps, staring into the cosmos and praying for some sign of stability. The minds of men were not built to consider such sweeping timescales as this, the kind which diluted the finger's bloodline to water and eroded his most enduring legacy to dust on the wind. To stand here was to be forcibly reminded of one's place and prominence in a world already steeped in history. Felix wondered if Karl Franz or Magnus the Pious, or even Sigmar himself, would have felt the same way in his shoes. The thought should have probably shamed him for its boldness, but for some reason it did not. Do you ever feel that we're on the wrong side of history? No. Felix smiled weakly, glancing over the shoulder to the prick of light and occasional voices from the camp across the river. He could smell cooking oats. His stomach tightened with hunger. Some other disturbed sense made him shudder. Doesn't all this make you wonder about the people who lived here? Will this be us one day? Is this what will be left of the Empire if we fail? Middenheim won't look nearly so pretty in five thousand years. Felix examined the ruins with a new perspective. Could they really be so old? Now that he was looking at them in this way, he recognized that this town had none of the features he had come to associate with dwarfish settlements. There were no gyrocopter towers, such as the dwarves used for swift communication and provisioning of isolated outposts. He had seen none of the great stone bastions used for housing cannons. Felix knew that the dwarves had taught the secrets of gunpowder to men and helped to found the engineering schools that, as much as the colleges of magic, had made the empire the force it was. Felix clung sadly to that final thought. Was. Was it possible that there had been a time when even the dwarves did not possess this knowledge? It seemed difficult to believe. Although it did make sense intellectually, he had simply assumed that dwarves were gifted with an inherent racial understanding of such secrets. The realization that they had mastered them over the centuries of methodical trial and error only deepened Felix's respect for their achievements. It made them more determined than ever that something of their civilization be spared. With one more glance over the shoulder, he joined Godric in the examination of the marker stone. The granite was green with age, and framed by a thicket of brambles that had pushed through the softer stones amongst which it had been set. The runes carved into it were still legible, however, and Godric had pulled down the obscuring weeds. At least Felix hoped that they were. They were just cuts in the rock to him, and had he not been here with Godric, he probably would have dismissed them as something scratched into it by a passing bird. It is Klinkerhun, Manling, rune script, but very old. It's difficult to be sure, but I think we're on the right track. The dwarf looked up and peered down the street, his dark adapted eyes piercing the gloom in a way that Felix could only envy. Let's head on and see if we can find another. There's dozens of old roads heading into the mountains, and I don't want to be two days out before realizing we're on the wrong one. Felix nodded his agreement as the slayer stood up and stomped down the road. He paused to examine the rune script. There was something mournful about it, in need of remembrance. Could it really be something as simple as a road sign they were following? Empire Strasse, Middenheim, 125 miles? The outlandish thought made Felix smile as he turned away and after his former companion. 
it felt good to have a destination again. It was something to cling to, and that was a hope of its own kind. Their footsteps echoed in the ruins. Godric was actually being cautious, Felix realized, but even so, his hobnailed boots scratched at the stillness like climbing pitons on bare stone. Felix glanced over his shoulder, convinced for a moment that he had heard the footfalls of another moving in parallel through the ruins. He dismissed it as the work of his imagination. Either that or his own too loud footsteps rebounding back at him. His mail shirt no longer seemed entirely adequate, as he drew his cloak over his shoulders, as though the ragged Sudanland wool was a welcome layer of added protection for his back. Felix held his sword a little more closely than he had before, matching the slayer's shorter stride so that their feet hit the road in unison. There was loneliness here, of a kind that he had not seen elsewhere, not in the misted swamps of Albion, nor even the lifeless sands of Nehekara. These ruins were steeped in it, like stones in the desert which had absorbed all the heat all day and now radiated it at night. He mentioned the feeling to Godric. Even in my people's golden age, when Karaza Karak could put a throng of fifty thousand upon the field and not suffer one less hammer at their forges, there were not but a few thousand here. They made the go of it, they were dwarves, but they left in the end. Felix strained his eyes into the dark that filled the crumbling relics on either side as if by willpower alone he could make them see as well as Godric could. His imagination populated the shadows with goblin raiders, charging through the streets on their wolf mounts while dwarves screamed and their city was looted and burned. But Felix couldn't see any obvious indication of battle damage. Skaven, perhaps. His heart beat a little faster at the thought of that vile, duplicitous race. He did not think himself a hateful man or a coward but he hated and feared the Ratman more than any other horror he had encountered. They were poisoners, assassins and saboteurs. They had murdered his father, nearly killed him more than once, and, but for a fortuitous twist of fate here and there, had nearly brought down the Empire long before now. Even in failure they had burned half of Nuln to the ground and destroyed the gunnery school. He fought back to that third set of footsteps, that he had convinced himself were just his imagination. By Sigmar, he prayed, tightening his grip on his sword, let it be Skaven. What happened? He managed to ask, after a few minutes of picturing what he would do to the rat he found between him and Cat. Nothing happened, Mandling. There was just nothing here worth staying for. The inherent sadness of that caused Felix's shoulders to droop, and eased his grip on the sword. And the temple that Lorin mentioned? Gautre gave a disparaging snort. That witless old fool! It is not a temple, it is a fortress. What does the name mean? Gautre pursed his lips and considered. There are some words that your language does not have meanings for. Suffice to say, Manling, that it does not exist, or it would have been found by now. The road we looked for was not built by the dwarves that once lived here, but is one of the dozens laid by the explorers who came hunting for the legend of Kazad Drengazi. Gatrek pointed northwards and up. Felix could see nothing, except maybe the glint of something metallic catching the light of the stars, but took it on faith that the slayer was indicating the citadel on the mountain. The last dwarves to abandon the old dwarf hold traveled north on one such road and took it to your lands, or what would eventually become your lands. It was they who helped the humans turn Middenheim into the fortress she is now. They gave her walls dug her mines, and even laid the designs for the funicular that serves the summit today. Felix's eyes widened, but he said nothing. He had given up trying to comprehend the age of this place. The Faustschlag had been an unassailable stronghold long before Sigmar turned the disparate human tribes into the Empire. Those early miners found a labyrinth of caves and tunnels within the mountains, Gatrek went on. One was extended to meet the road from here. 
Godric snorted thoughtfully, dropping to a knee to inspect another of the roadside rune markers that Felix hadn't even spotted was there. Although I doubt Grimnir himself could tell you why. So that was how Godric planned to pass under the chaos hordes which undoubtedly besieged the city of the White Wolf and get inside. A gust of wind from the north carried an eerie moan in the ruins. Dare he even hope? Was that wise? Building a back door into your fortress, I mean? Who else could stumble upon these same roads? Godric scraped the moss from the marker with his thumbnail and grunted. Impossible. Felix wished he could be so sure. Before he could open his mouth to seek further reassurance, Godric raised his hand for quiet and sniffed at the air. Godric licked his finger and held it up to find the wind, turning in its direction, north, down the street, and glared into the dark. Felix bit his lips, sword raised. What is it? Quiet. I thought I smelled something. The dwarf turned to Felix, who shook his head. He still had the smell of cooked toads in his nose, and he suspected that even had he not, it would have been difficult to detect much beyond the gentle reek of his own unwashed clothing. I told you, you wanted Kolya, he murmured. He's good at this kind of thing. The Kislevite had formerly made his living hunting monstrous game across the troll country and the Goromadni mountains, trading the prized carcasses with the Kurgan-speaking tribes dwelling there. He didn't have an old man's tired eyes or aching joints, nor did he have the same need for a bedroll and a fire and a cupful of gruel that Felix did. More importantly, he was Gotrek's rememberer now, and his place was surely here. Was it the man's laxity or Gotrek's conscious choice that had Felix here in his stead? The slayer muttered gruffly and then fell silent, standing up and crossing over the road as if Felix hadn't spoken at all. Over here, manling, Gotrek's lowered voice called back from under the shadows. I don't think we're alone. Gustav Jaeger and two free company men in soiled burgundy and gold overlaid with plate armor and cloaks crunched around the footprint left in the soft mud. It was a little bigger than a man's. Gustav sank his finger into the print, eyeing the rushing ribbon of pearly white froth that roared by them. He had a strange notion to taste the muck on his finger, but resisted and shook his hand dry with a scowl. He was being watched, judged, and it was making him jumpy. What are you thinking, friend Gustav? I'm thinking I'm not gonna be sleeping tonight. Kolya grinned and squatted down the opposite side of the print, tracing it with his finger as though mentally mapping the shape. The shells and pebbles tied into his coat by colored ribbons bounced softly off one another as he moved. The square patches of hemp that made up his clothes were gray in the dark, but no less bright by contrast to their surroundings. A freshly drawn henna in the style of a horse glittered with a faintly metallic tint from his forearm. He stood, planting his own foot in the mud beside the print and backing away to examine it. Larger than man and heavier. See how deep it is compared to mine. Gustav studied the print intently. He was no tracker. He had peppered Kolya and these men he was expected to lead with questions on the topic, but there was no escaping the fact that he had never traveled anywhere without the aid of a road and a hired guide until the Battle of Badenhof had forced him to. His skills would never be a match for those of these other men. He knew that. Men like his uncle. Nevertheless, the print looked to him to be no more than a few hours old. Some kind of monster, growled one of the men, a scarred greybeard named Sturm with a sword across his bent legs and a half-cocked pistol in hand. I don't know, Kolya admitted, but I have seen prints like this before on the oblast. The Kislevite scanned the opposite shore drawing his bow halfway taut to sight along the shaft. The tassels attached to the recurved ends fluttered lightly in the breeze. The middle mountains were a long way from the northern oblast, but Gustav could see the huntsman's instinct at work. To Gustav, the darkened ruins looked insectile, giant spiders on segmented legs of black limestone. 
They hugged the mountainside as though wanting to scurry down and overwhelm them. Do you see anything? he hissed. Kolya lowered his bow, brow knotted in consternation. Gustav swallowed nervously. Something that Kolya couldn't spot was infinitely worse than anything he could. Double watch tonight, said Kolya. Eyes on bridge and keep distance from river. He turned to Gustav and pursed his lips, a fatalistic shrug so subtle it didn't even disturb the shells in his coat. Then for sake of your uncle, pray it is more interested in us than him. Felix covered his nose and mouth against the scent of rot. It filled the rubble-strewn portico that Gatrick had led him under, clinging to the weeds that grew like a cocoon around the sickly green corpse that lay towards the back of the room. It was a goblin. Its foot was clamped between the jaws of a bear trap which had been hidden among the rubble. Judging from the state of the wretch's fingernails and the bloody scratches between its ankle and knee, Felix reasoned that it had spent a good portion of its final hours trying to claw its way free. It was dark and beginning to bloat, and what looked like tiny bite marks were evident across its body. Felix took a step forward, rubble crunching underfoot and sending rats squealing through the undergrowth for the far corners of the structure. His heart was thumping. Edging forwards, he crouched behind the corpse. A prickly thicket of dandelions held up the goblin's body like a cushion, only its strangler's hands and arrow-shaped head hanging over the edges. Its eyes and lips had been eaten. Felix covered his mouth again and turned back to the doorway where Gotrek had remained, wedged under the doorframe, axe held lightly in one hand and scanning the opposite side of the street with his one good eye. I doubt this poor thing has been following anyone for at least a week. Pity for a goblin, manling. For shame. With a sigh, Felix sheathed his sword and instead drew a short knife from a leather pocket inside his right boot. He used it to clear away some of the weeds and rot around the bear trap and frowned. Even under the merest whisper of moonlight, the sharp steel was gleaming. There were no markings anywhere on it to suggest that it had ever been worked by a tool. It was, quite simply, some of the finest workmanship Felix had ever seen. Left by one of the expeditions that passed this way, no doubt, said Godrek, and then returned his gaze to the street. The slayer's weariness was setting Felix on edge. Is there something out there? Godrek grunted, noncommittal and without turning towards him, jabbed the eye of his axe up to the ceiling. From the outside, it had looked like this building had another couple of stories. Although the thought of traipsing through rats and darkness and who knew what else, to find a set of stairs that might not even hold his weight, was strangely unappealing. Why don't you go to take a look, manling? said Gotrek absently, settling in to watch. I'll just wait down here. Morzana, prophetess of the Dark Master, had seen the moment that a dozen mutant knights in full battle regalia had piled into her chamber a hundred times, long before she finally heard the clatter of their footsteps up the stairs of the tower she was adopting as her own. The only furnishing was an unused mattress of bound straw that lay against a wall, more for the appearance of it, the acceptance of a kind gesture, than for its utility. The rest of the floor was occupied by fragments of stone which had crumbled from the ceiling. Weeds hung down, ropey creepers playing against her small, dark horns as she paced beneath them. She walked to the window. It was wide and tall, installed for the view rather than for defense, and that was one of the reasons she had chosen it and no other had wanted it. She leaned out. The mountains were felt rather than seen a cold breeze from a depthless void. The ruined township lay against it, a stitch on a black cloth. The stream was a thin gurgle in the distance. She frowned, and then slid a few inches to the left. Here. There came a knock on the door, and she smiled brightly. Delphic fangs catching the moonlight. That had been unexpected, a nuance that prophecy could conceal. She turned her hunch back to the window and smoothed down the glittering black silk of her dress, straightening the jet spider brooch that held it all in place. 
she had played the Ungol wise woman for many years, and it was a comforting guise to inhabit. It suited her. She had enjoyed the wandering, the isolation, the empty miles of oblast separating herself from the dreams of others. The fear in which even those who had ridden hundreds of leagues to receive her wisdom had held her was something she had enjoyed less, but which she had always respected. She had earned their fear, and it suited her too. And even in the empire, where men couldn't know an Ungol for a Ropsman or a Gospodar, the instinct to fear a crone in black remained. It is open, she answered, voice as clear as moonlight despite the age evident in her appearance. A square-jawed warrior with a rectangular iron shield in each of his two left hands pushed through the door and stepped to one side to admit the immense armored form of High Tsar Königsmann. The one-time Grand Master of Wolfenberg's Knights of the Bull wore his stigmata with grace, but the signs of the Dark Master's favor were there. A large man, he was simply immense in the full plate and circuit of his fallen order. But the proportions were not quite right. His huge chest and thick arms were oversized in comparison to his legs. His bovine nose was too flat and broad as though it had been crushed and a thin strip of black hair was just beginning to spread out from his beard and fringe. His fearsome bull-horned helm he held under arm. Did you have trouble sleeping, prophetess? grunted the high czar, nodding towards the bed. Always, my lord, Morzana answered with a glossy smile. It sounded as though you were having a bad dream. Morzana sighed. In her mind's eye, she saw a dark Templar, the rupture in his breastplate where it would be, the blood that would dye his white surcoat red. It was not mine. Königsmann grunted again, as men did in the presence of one who saw their futures more clearly than they saw their own past, taking his helm in both hands and rolling it between his palms. As he did so, the knights promised by prophecy to Morzana piled in. Moonlight glittered across their bared blades, lifted the white from the black on the once proud tabards of Ostland's boldest. Horned helms and fiendishly spiked knee and elbow guards tangled the slender spaces between them like branches in an ancient wood. And not all of them were components of the warrior's armor. Slathering muscular tongues glowed with faint bioluminescence in the dark. Pincer claws clacked open and shut like the vaccinations of some predatory flower. Tentacles thicker than a strong man's neck flexed and slithered across man-mountains of steel plate. For as long as there had been men in Ostland, small bands of mutants had lived a nomadic life in the isolation of the Middle Mountains. These men were not they, though. They had fled with their master from the doom of Wolfenburg and had forged for him an army worthy of their patron. And where they rode, the seed and the shadow of Belacor had gone with them. The outsiders are still coming, Königsmann hissed suddenly, striding past Morzana to the window and looking out. The Dark Knight scowled, stiffly lowering his helm to the weathered window ledge. The alpine wind ruffled his beard and drew goosebumps from his darkening demon-touched skin. Is it him, the mortal warrior that can strike such terror in a god's heart? Morzana closed her eyes, summoning the image of a flame-crested dwarf and a handsome swordsman in a red cloak to her mind. An almost maternal warmth filled her. She didn't know whether this particular vision was present, past or future, for this pair had touched her life at every stage. But for them, Morzana wouldn't be here at all, for she could still see the doomed world in which Morzana the child had perished in the purging fires of Mordheim. If only the Dark Master's nemesis could see what she saw, could know how, through her, he had changed the world and how he would change it yet. His destiny illuminated the heavens like a star, and gods and men alike ignored it at their peril. He is a wanderer, she whispered, opening her eyes and banishing the vision from her mind. He is a warrior and demon slayer. His fate will shape the world and others beyond it. He is to be the Dark Master's downfall. And he wishes to escape this destiny? 
Morzana parted her lips into a soft smile of devil's fine teeth. How was it that everyone bar her continually misunderstood the nature of fate? It was not an arrow that struck at random and could be avoided with luck. It was what would be. It was what had to be. If anyone has the power to try, it is him. If anyone has the arrogance to believe they can succeed, it is him. Very well, said Königsmann heavily. We'll take their scouts while they're separated, and then hit their camp while they sleep. Spread the word. He jabbed his finger into the double-shielded knight's breastplate. Come on, the ambush personally. The Dark Master will arise. Aye, my lord, said the knight, marching from the chamber and taking half of the warriors with him. Can you tell me any more of how we will triumph? asked Königsmann, turning to Morzana. Triumph, my lord? Morzana asked coldly. In her mind she already saw the ruptured breastplate, the blood on white. There was another reason she had selected this tower to be her quarters, despite suffering neither cold nor fatigue. My lord, one of the knights muttered, a heavy-set man in a scythe-edged harness of articulated plate with a stone bull pectoral clamped over his chest. His visored helm was open to reveal yellow eyes and a thin mustache. He scratched at one side of his head, mirroring something that had appeared in Königsmann's. It was a red dot, the tip of a lance of light that, from the angle, appeared to originate from a higher tower or possibly from the mountain itself. That she did not know. With an irritated expression, the high czar bent his head and swatted at the dot. His hand passed through it. The dot danced unperturbed over his temple. You were kind to me, high czar, said Morzana. You deserved a more caring master. The thunderous report of what sounded like a small cannon rumbled through the ruined township just as Felix threw his shoulder into the pine door for the third and final time and burst through onto a viewing platform. It looked like it had been a belfry. The walls were open on all sides except for narrow corner supports which held a tiled roof. There was no sign of a bell, but Felix could see the stanchion what it used to be. He imagined it being used to sound shift changes to the workers in the mines above, or to alert them about an attack. Felix ran to the nearest ledge and peered out. It was like looking out to sea on a moonless night. It was only shapes, the whisper of an icy breeze, the fading echoes of a gunshot. And what was that? He held out his breath and listened. Yes, he could definitely hear running feet, the clink of mail, the clap of swords in their scabbards. He blinked hard and tried again to see. For a moment, he wondered if his eyesight was finally going the way of his joints. Then he scowled and disregarded it. He doubted that a slow decline into decrepitude was something he was going to have to worry about soon. Who had taken that shot? There were a few handgunners among Mann's troop, but none of them carried anything big enough to make a noise like that, and all of them were back in the camp anyway. Felix's stomach dropped as the upshot of that hit him. He and Gotrek had managed to separate themselves from their own force and walk straight into a potential enemy. He had to warn Gotrek. He pulled back from the ledge, just as the Slayer's bellicose roar from the street below heralded the clangor of steel on steel. Felix swore. Gotrek had sent him up here on purpose to get him out of the way. He clutched his sword and turned to run back the way he had come. Damn that Slayer! And damn his oath. 